My name's John Michael, and you guys are pretty weird. It's, it's okay. We're in the same boat. I self-identify myself as a queer performance artist. I sometimes wear in the other butt pocket just to confuse you. I'm a queer performance artist. And as one, I think I can fix things, not like a car, but like oppression. <laughs> With my art powers, I have transformed the word queer into meaning more than just gay or not straight. Now it means not to. It says no to categories. It means weird. That MC of ours, the one with a top hat and the weird baggy clothing. I mean, notice how he's so naively open to other ways of thinking, to other people, to different things, to things that might scare him. Face it, Russ. You're a fucking queer. And you're beautiful. I can use it as a verb, too. I can queer concepts. Yes. Like the idea that um, normalcy is possible and you should try to strive for it. When queering ideas, I tear that motherfucking notion of a wall straight down to the ground. Not just like, cause like I like to watch things fall, but because once it's lying in a heap of rubble, we have the opportunity to build it back up together anew. When queering stuff, we can clear things up. Instead of saying, let's clear things up. Let's say, let's queer things up. I love queering things up with my father. <laughs> He's so open to me. Wait, wait, but you know, that was a process. I didn't do that right away with my daddy. No, no. It's quite similar to when I start performing for someone. I try to start out gentle. Because if you get rough right away, they'll close up and you'll have nowhere to go because they're stuck in thought. But I'm not worried with you people. No, you're really weird. I have this one beginning where I come on stage with my pants undone. I tell my audience, it's of the utmost importance you understand why my pants are undone. I came from the restroom. And not to let something out, but to let something in? <laughs> A butt plug. Yes. I proceed to sit down because like most of my writing, it's going to get deep when I explain it. I proceed to make um, a plethora of butt plug jokes, hands-free, of course. <laughs> I then um, go on to something topical, like uh, Rick Perry's the boogeyman, or here's some um, tips to cleaning Santorum right up. <laughs> the last one isn't political, it's actually quite domestic. I then tell my audience that I have been lying to them. I stand up to confess what's in me is more than a $10 butt plug. <laughs> it's you. You are the butt plug! <laughs> Welcome to the show! Oh, don't close up. Don't close up. Make yourselves at home. Literally, me rectum, Sue rectum! Usually with uh, people who are trying so desperately to be normal. 
I start off with uh, something that all of us can relate to from our diverse backgrounds. Hot teachers. They make the learning process hot. You're twice as likely to learn the periodic table if you can get hard on the periodic table and whatever girls do. <laughs> I went to an... Thank you. I went to an all... <laughs> in Dallas, I went to an all-boy high school, a Catholic school, and um, we had this hot teacher, and hot teacher's name in this case is Mrs. Tuts. What? Thought I was gonna be a dude? Nah, man! This was in high school to have a crush. You need to know what is crushing you. Mrs. Tuts? Well, was known by all of us boys at my high school as Mrs. Tits. We weren't that clever. <laughs> Mrs. Tuts came from Minnesota, and instead of bringing an accent from Minnesota, Mrs. Tuts brought these scarves that she wore every day. Not just any scarf. Fuzzy. Fun, flirtatious, glittery scarves. <laughs> it didn't matter if it was August in Dallas, Texas. She'd be wearing one of those fuzzy, fun, flirtatious, glittery scarves. And all of us boys, we made fun of them. I mean, we had to. Not only were they fuzzy, fun, flirtatious, but they were glittery, so they were gay. Gay. Secretly, all of us boys were fond of those scarves. We'd never admit this, though. I am um, admired at the uh, finesse. Wait, wait, no. I would have said a uh, commitment. Yes, commitment that she um, had to pull off those scarves with. The other boys admired how they amplified her already massive breasts. Mrs. Tuts was cool at my school because she was feminine. Everything feminine at that school was placed onto a pedestal for constant worshipping. However, there was a system to that worship. Things you were supposed to do, things you weren't in displaying it. You're in ninth period, and you're sitting at your desk. This is what you were supposed to do. Tuts is walking up and down the aisle, and she drops a pen right next to your desk. She bends over to get that pen, and you watch her bend over. And as she comes up, her blouse does not keep up with her breasts, and you see a nipple. You get hard. It's all it takes when you're 15. But then you realize you're at a desk. No one else can see. You can let it grow. <laughs> You're in this wonderful place in your head where there's this fantasy is taking place of what you think you're supposed to want. Ah. And where you should be taking your chemistry notes. You begin to sketch down that fantasy. Mrs. Tuts is uh, standing behind her desk. Scratch that. Mrs. Tuts is uh, bent over her desk for a little stretch. You're behind Mrs. Tuts. You're in Mrs. Tuts. Is this it? taming your chemistry teacher by fucking her doggy style as you pull up on the reins that is one of those fuzzy, fun, flirtatious, glittery scarves is what you were supposed to do. What you weren't supposed to do is go the gap and buy one of those fuzzy, fun, flirtatious, <laughs> glittery scarves. You just weren't. I chose to um, draw pictures like that, creating a distance between what I wanted and what I thought I wanted. 
the distance is quite fitting because that's how you're supposed to show your affection for femininity at that school, at a distance. You could love and lust for femininity, but you couldn't emulate it. I didn't know how to do that. At age seven, I was given this bracelet to inform my every decisions. On it were inscribed the letters WWJD. What would Jesus do would be the question I asked before I did anything. Why? Because, well, I loved Jesus because I was told Jesus loved me no matter what I did. And I thought that was such a great concept. And I wanted to be just like Jesus and wearing that bracelet. Loving Jesus was how I learned to love through imitation. It's a wonderful way of living, one where you choose to open yourself up to someone. You let them into the soup that is you, and you stir round and round. <laughs> where are you going? You don't know somebody else is in ya. And that's the point. The great thing about that way of living is that you'll never stay stagnant. I so wish I could tell all of you that I've never been stagnant. I sincerely wish that. Really. I wish I could make that statement into a Facebook status that all of you could like. I wish everything I could perform would be as pretty as a Facebook profile you spend Friday nights editing again and again alone to try to get more connected. Won't somebody just poke me? <sighs> I drew pictures like that because I wanted to fill the role that I thought I was supposed to fill. I went in my brother's eyes. He was so cool at my school. He was a senior when I was a freshman, and I wanted him to point me out. The newspaper editor, and not a nerd. How do you pull that off, right? I wanted him to point me out to his high school friends. He had so many friends. I wanted him to say, hey, you see that high school freshman over there who doesn't think before he speaks? That's John Colgan. He's my brother, and he's going to be something. I so wanted to be acknowledged that I failed to acknowledge being myself. Thank you.